This is a podcast from the Fitzwilliam Museum, Cambridge. My name is Elizabeth Edwards. I'm Professor in Cultural History of Photography at the University of the Arts in London. And I've specialised for many years in anthropological photography, um, particularly of the 19th century. I was asked to select the photographs for this exhibition. And it has been extremely challenging because so many issues come out of Darwinian thinking which are expressed photographically it was difficult to find a way that I was satisfied with that really encapsulated the story we ought to tell. I wanted to show photographs as a form of mass dissemination that linked into Darwinian ideas. I'm not suggesting that all the photographs in the exhibition were overtly made to a sort of Darwinian recipe, if you like, but they became absorbed into this particular intellectual environment. I think we have to remember that the Darwinian years were the classic photographic years. The Origin of Species, published in 1859, came only five years after the emergence of mass photographic dissemination. That is the invention of the wet collodion negative with the album print. And most of the photographs in the exhibition are made with this technology. This meant that photographs, rather than being just a few beautiful prints made by the calotype process, which were circulated amongst sort of the experimental educated classes, suddenly became a mass medium. They were uh, used in all sorts of varieties of, of ways, from family photographs, from early tourist photographs, scientific photographs. And so you have to imagine this explosion of very realistic photographic images suddenly circulating in the world. We're not talking here about just you know a few tens of thousands. We're probably talking in the millions of images that were circulating. And amongst those were those that that can very clearly be seen to address Darwinian ideas. And it's in many ways through photography that these Darwinian ideas become circulated in the popular imagination. I think also what is important is that, in terms of the exhibition, although these are very little objects and not as glamorous as some of the big salon paintings and the beautiful drawings and and the botanical illustrations and so forth, I think these are images that have this, as I said, this massive circulation and they were seen by more people in the world and, if you like, influenced what people thought about the world that they were in than almost all those other images put together. I mean, this, I don't think, is an extravagant claim. This is mass media material. So when I came to select material for my section of the exhibition, I wanted to get this sense of massing. This is why I was very interested in showing images, particularly from carte de visite, and the way that images that Darwin himself owned actually related to all sorts of other sort of photographic forms that we encounter. And I tried to put these ideas of the popular and the scientific and this flow of images between the two together to create this section which sort of clusters around ideas of the descent of man. The only images in this section which were actually owned by Darwin himself are four photographs which came from the Musée de Paris probably in the mid-1860s. These are part of a much, much larger series which were taken largely by two photographers called Poto and Rousseau who were working for the Musée de Paris around about 1860. They were taking what were known as type photographs These were photographs that represented people full face and profile so that you could actually see the cranial qualities of both, as I say, full face and profile. And from those images, you were meant to read some sort of, if you like, evolutionary message about how the racial and therefore cultural qualities of the images and the people that they represented. In the exhibition, I chose um, a pair from India and a pair from North Africa. Darwin has 32 of these photographs, that's 16 pairs. I think they're very, very interesting because it's quite clear that somebody has selected these specially for him. They're not random at all. If you lay out the whole set, somebody has selected 
one from each continent, one pair from each continent. So there's some from New Caledonia, there's some from North America, there's some from Southern Europe, there's some from Northern Europe, there's some from Asia. I don't think Darwin did this himself. I think it was probably, probably, I say, done for him by Cotrefage, who was the director of the Laboratory of Anthropology in Paris at the time, and with whom Darwin corresponded. And I think he put this set together, because what he's done is select these 32 or so from a series of about 480. So it's a very personalised selection. What happens to these photographs is actually very typical of this flow between the popular and the scientific, but also the way in which photographs can be read over all sorts of different intellectual domains, if you like. Darwin is obviously seeing these photographs as uh, representations of the unity of mankind in keeping with his theories of human origin. If you like, it's a monogenist theory. However, interestingly, exactly the same set of photographs is owned by Louis Agassiz at Harvard. He was a polygenist who believed that the, if you like, the space between the so-called pinnacle of civilization evolution, the white Anglo-Saxon male, was so far from, say, the Negroid races that they could only be explained as being completely separate species. That is, they came from separate origins. Yet he owns the same set of photographs and is making completely different meanings from these photographs. So I think this demonstrates very neatly the way that photographs are, are what we call in the trade uh, infinitely recodable, in that people make meanings around photographs from the cultural knowledge and, uh, that they bring to them. And this is what is happening through all these photographs that I selected. I wanted to show that flow between scientific meaning and popular meaning and how photographs performed, literally performed, over both these registers. Perhaps the most um, widespread uh, form of photography that circulates through the world and is bought in both popular domains and scientific domains is the humble carte de visite. These photographs were made in their millions. Many of them are of celebrities and actresses and there was even one of Darwin himself, which was sold in London. But one of the things that one could also buy were, if you like, the racial types of the world. And I wanted in the exhibition to show a sense of massing. So in the exhibition, I've put together a frame of about 30 or 40 of these photographs. I would have happily have covered the whole wall, actually. Because what happens is that these photographs are made sort of in the colonial periphery. We've got included a lot of photographs here from Dufty Studios in Fiji and his cousin who had a, a photographic studio in New Caledonia. And these photographs one finds in sailors' albums, but you also find them in scientific collections. There are Dufty photographs here in Cambridge, um, they're in London, they're in Harvard, they're in Oxford, they're in Paris, they're in Vienna, they're in Berlin, you get the picture, literally. And so I wanted to get this sense of this circulation of photographs so that you find these photographs in tourist albums, but they also become absorbed into science. But at the same time, they are picking up the language of science. They're often referred to as types, which, of course, is the word I used of Darwin's own photographs that he collected from the Musée de Paris, which were made within a scientific domain as types. And, of course, the notion of the type is so important, and this is where I think these images sort of resonate with a Darwinistic kind of thinking, is the type... Is, 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 if you like, the setting up of the parameters of variation out of which evolutionary change would come. And so the type is actually central to Darwinian and biological thinking at the time. And Huxley is using it at the same time around photographs. So I think you, you get this sense of these photographs of racial types, of local types, and you get all sorts of language around the type, a local type, a typical Aboriginal man, a dusky bell. They're all they are all sort of languages of of generalization of the generic, if you like. And these sort of flow through the cut of his eat. And so what I wanted to do in the exhibition was kind of show the mass of these images that circulated. So we've you know we've got examples from Fiji, from Japan, from Australia, but I was also 
extremely keen to show that it wasn't just the colonial other, if you like, that, it, that is the subject of this kind of photography, but all sorts of of, of sort of domestic exotic, if you like. So we've got a photograph here of a flint napper who used to make some sort of forged Paleolithic tools for the tourist trade in rural Suffolk in Britain. And in the exhibition, you know, he's he's next door to Fijian chiefs and supposed headhunters from New Caledonia. There are also photographs of Sami people from northern Scandinavia, so it's very much about the internal other as well. So what I wanted to show is is, is how all peoples were brought into this analytical matrix of human development. In many ways, the carte de visite photographs and the language that's used of them draws its legitimation from the language of hard science and the imagery of a hard science. As I said, you know, the notion of the type is so important here. And there was a move in the 1870s, is exactly the moment that Darwin is publishing The Descent of Man and also the emerging discipline of anthropology, which isn't really a discipline as we recognise it now, just as science wasn't really a profession as we recognise it now at this period. But there were all these people who were interested in human origins coming out of the medical sciences, the biological sciences, but also out of things like philology, history of religion, folklore studies, who were interested in human origins and beginning to call themselves anthropologists. And not only, I should say, were they interested in human origins, but they're also interested in cultural origins. But because culture was seen to be, um, if you like, biologically determined, there was an, an almost indistinguishable link between the biological and the cultural. They mapped onto each other. So what anthropologists or proto-anthropologists were trying to do at this period was actually improve the quality of data around racial science. And I think when we talk about racial science, I mean, this has come to assume a very different meanings since 1945 and the realisation of where this led in absolutely horrific terms, and also in terms of the way we understand multicultural societies of modern Europe. But I think we have to realise that while we may view these photographs with distaste, if not horror, I was very keen to address these issues in the exhibition because I think it's a history of the way we think about the world which is not very often shown. And I think this exhibition, with its profoundly intelligent way of dealing with really very difficult issues around race, around culture, around evolution, was actually the ideal forum in which to explore some fairly difficult images and I was very very keen to get them in because I I think if you like it's the darker side of Darwinian theory and particularly the way people used it and the exhibition would have been lacking if we did not address it you know if I were a critic looking at the exhibition I would say where's this and it's very important that it was there so what I wanted to show was some images of, say, shall we call hard science. It's images like this that, in a way, set up a kind of iconography that feeds into the carte de visite and the language of type. However, these were not images that were very widely circulated, contrary to popular imagination. And I was very interested in some of these images that came out of a project Thomas Huxley, of course, Darwin's great disciple, did as president of the Ethnological Society in 1869 to 70. Through the good offices of the colonial office, he tried to do a racial survey of the British Empire. He had instructions made for photographers, which were sent out with sample photographs which were made in North London, to sent out to the colonies to show how these photographs of the different races of the colonies were to be made. Very few came back. In fact, it's very interesting that there is a lot of resistance to taking these photographs out in the colonies, whether this is for humanitarian reasons, which I get a sense in many cases it was, or whether it's quite simply that people were disturbed about these kind of very hard racial photographs and that they would actually undermine the colonial status quo. It's very difficult to tell. Whatever the question, there was resistance and very, very little taken precisely to Huxley's instructions actually came back. 
And what's interesting is that what was taken and came back, according to his instructions, were taken in prisons and hospitals where people actually had very little control. Elsewhere, there seems to be massive resistance to this. But interestingly, what colonial governors send back, trying to comply with the instructions from their masters in Whitehall, were, you've guessed, carte de visite. So again, it shows this flow between the scientific. But what these hard science pictures wanted was actually a photograph which could be read mathematically. You could actually, if you like, attempt to read cranial measurement off the photograph. So Huxley's are all taken very carefully posed to show the physical characteristics. You know, if you like, the hand is turned out to the camera so you can actually see the structure of radius and ulna coming down the, the arm. These are very, very, very carefully posed. And as I say, it was a mathematization of the body which actually wasn't very successful. There's very little evidence to show that Darwin used pictures like this, and certainly I don't think Huxley was particularly interested. I think they were actually visually flawed. They didn't come up to expectations. The one that is used perhaps more often is a system by Lamprey, which was published in 1869, and I think the only reason it's used is that it is actually published. It comes out in the Journal of the Ethnological Society of London. It was a tipped-in album and print into the pages of the journal, which we show in the exhibition. And I think because this was a journal that was read out in the colonies, I think this is why you begin to get this system used and not Huxley's. But uh, what's really interesting is that these images, again, filter through into the carte de visite market and they turn up in a German album of the mid-1870s. So what you're getting is this massive circulation of images between the popular and the scientific in a way that you cannot really distinguish between the two. The popular becomes scientific because it gets collected in certain ways, like that carte de visite photographs. The scientific become popular because actually what's happening is the kind of iconography that's set up as scientific in the realms of hard science begins to filter through as an iconographical device for representing racial types. And you find this becomes very much more codified as the 19th century goes on. You get a much harder kind of portrait type coming out of commercial photographic studios by the end of the 19th century because in many ways what they've done is picked up this kind of scientific form of representation as, if you like, an iconographical norm for representing colonialised people. And this is what you begin to see in the Beatty photographs of the Tasmanian Aboriginals which were so widely disseminated and are in the exhibition as well.